Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, First United Methodist Church of Salado, Texas. Uh, today is Transfiguration Sunday. The Sunday is the 14th of February, uh, 2021. Some people may say it's also Valentine's Day, but uh, we as the church are celebrating Transfiguration Sunday this morning and then leaving you to celebrate the way you want to later on today. Uh, I want you to know that this coming Wednesday is Ash Wednesday and we will be broadcasting and uh, we will do our service on Vimeo and Ash Wednesday, as you know, begins Lent and so uh, next week is Lent 1, the first Sunday of Lent and we will be meeting live on Sunday morning, the 21st of uh, of February uh, at nine o'clock in the morning, we will be inside, and if possible, at eleven o'clock, we will be outside. Uh, you will need to register with the church office, and you can follow the directions that will be sent to you by uh, email. And uh, if uh, if possible, if you can't register for the early service inside, there's plenty of room outside, and we can accommodate three, four, five hundred people should you uh, choose to want to come. Uh, I would ask that as we uh, begin our service today that you might stand and our first hymn is I Sing the Almighty Power of God. May we stand please. Please be seated, and I would like to lift up a few things for our time of prayer this morning before we go to silent prayer. I want us to remember the family of Milton, uh, who uh, passed away this uh, last week. Uh, we want to be with Bobby Carroll and Milton Carroll's family uh, as they go through this grieving process. I also ask us to be in prayer for all those persons in our community and church who have either been through COVID or currently have it now. We ask 
that uh, God protect these folks and bring them back to full health again. We also pray for our country and uh, for the world and for all the turmoil that uh, we each are going through because of this. We pray that peace and unity might somehow be with us as we uh, go to God in prayer. Let us pray in silence. Holy God, upon the mountain you revealed our Messiah, who by his death and resurrection would fulfill both the law and the prophets. By his transfiguration, may you enlighten our path, that we may dare to suffer with him in the service of all humanity, and so share in the everlasting glory of him, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God forever. And we pray in his holy name, our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn of uh, preparation is Jesus Calls Us Over the Tumult. And I would invite you to stand as Terry leads us in our singing today. be seated. I would invite you, if you would, to uh, turn in your Bibles, if you have it with you, to 2 Kings, the second chapter, the first 12 verses. Uh, it's the day's lesson for Transfiguration Sunday. Hear these words. Now, when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way from Gilgal. Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. The company of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha, and they said to him, 
do you know that today the Lord will be taking your master away from you? And he said, yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, stay here for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, as the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The company of prophets who were in Jericho drew near to Elisha and they said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take your master away from you? And he answered, Yes, I know. Be silent. Then Elijah said to him, Stay here for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the company of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them. They both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his mantle and he rolled it up and he struck the water and the water was parted to the one side and to the other until the two of them crossed over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I may do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please let me inherit a double share of your spirit. And he responded, You have asked a hard thing. Yet, if you see me as I am being taken from you, it will be granted you. If not, it will not. As they continued walking and talking, a chariot of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, and Elijah ascended in a whirlwind into heaven. Elisha kept watching and crying out, Father, Father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. But when he could no longer see him, he grasped his own clothes and tore them in two pieces. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today is a Sunday that marks some sort of transition. It's a transition between uh, Epiphany, the season that started right after Christmas tide, and it's a season that ends today on Transfiguration Sunday, the Sunday before Ash Wednesday, when we begin our season of Lent. Epiphany talks about the manifestation of Christ, how we see and experience Jesus in his baptism, in his mission, in the gifts that the Magi bring. And Lent, of course, is a penitential season when people look, see, recognize, confess their sins, and uh, confess to God that they want to go a different way, and that different way is to be faithful people uh, of God. This uh, transfiguration story is where uh, the prophetic mantle passes between Elijah, one of the great prophets of Israel, and Elisha, who is going to be his successor in this business of succession. What we see is a transition of prophetic leadership in Israel from one generation uh, to another. One of the reasons that this text is chosen for us today is simply because uh, it's uh, plays a role in the transfiguration of Jesus as uh, we note from our gospel lesson today, which is Mark 9, Jesus and Moses uh, are with Elijah on the mountaintop with Peter uh, and James and John. And so there's this scene where Jesus is transfigured before them. He becomes white and luminous and I would guess to uh, the three disciples that are with Jesus fairly scary to see this this whole scene and uh, what this is is something of a transition of leadership or of power we in our nation have recently gone through a transition of sorts of leadership and it didn't it didn't seem to go all that well uh, this particular transition is very theological and very fraught with the holy spirit uh, of god and so one of the things that we could maybe do 
as Christian stewards of leadership is to pay attention about how this is done. Uh, you know, I know leadership always shifts in the local church. Certainly there are churches where the ushers have been there for 60 years and wouldn't think of letting anyone else be an usher. Uh, I've been in churches where we would have a uh, finance chair who's been finance chair for 40 years and will not give up the church's checkbook to anybody. This is, is not healthy because there needs to be transitions in leadership, not only in churches, but in communities, in various uh, civic organizations and clubs and like the PTA or whatever letters they go by these days. Uh, the idea is that we share leadership with one another. We do not hoard it. And so this idea between Elisha and Elijah is uh, a way to show us uh, what happens. And uh, if you were listening uh, with any care whatsoever to the scripture lesson, you notice that there is a lot of repetition to it. The monologue, or I guess you could say even dialogue in a way, uh, is between Elisha and Elijah. And, he's, and they say, um, Elijah tells him he's going to go first to Bethel. And he tells Elisha to wait. And Elisha refuses to wait because he's going to stick with his mentor prophet who is Elijah. And then Elijah said that he's going to go on to Jericho and he tells Elisha to wait for him. But Elisha again refuses. And finally, Elijah says he's going to the Jordan River. And of course, you remember the Jordan River because that is the place where Jesus was baptized uh, some five or six or perhaps even seven centuries later. Now, uh, no matter what happens in this story, Elisha sticks with Elijah. He will not leave him. In fact, he says very much what Ruth said to her mother-in-law, Naomi, when uh, Naomi kept trying to shake her loose and have her remain back in Moab. And she said, I will not leave you. And that's uh, from Ruth 1.16. And so in Elisha's refusal to obey Elijah's command, uh, he, in a sort of backhanded way, reveals his faithfulness to his mentor, prophet and pastor who is Elijah. Uh, and, and so finally, Elijah, as he's getting ready to be translated into heaven, ask Elisha, is there something that I can do for you? And so Elisha doesn't ask for a, a house or a new car or some position of power or something like that. He asks him, for something very unusual, and that is a double share of, of Elijah's spirit, a double portion of Elijah's share of the spirit. And what this basically means is that whatever Elijah has going on for him, and he's had a lot going on for him in his prophetic ministry, he's made a lot of enemies of kings and especially king's wives like Jezebel, for example, that we know that he is a strong and powerful figure. And so Elisha, as the one who will inherit leadership from him, he wants a double portion of whatever it is that Elijah had going for him. And so uh, Elijah says, you've asked a very hard thing, but if you see me going up into heaven in the whirlwind, then this wish will be granted you. And so perhaps it will be. Um, and then he asks him to uh, make a sign, Elisha, to make a sign. And what he does is he sacrifices his oxen, which are his only way to make a living. So now he will uh, continue to be a prophet who is fed by the people that he encounters. And so he certainly does that. And uh, the double portion of the spirit 
is the spirit of creation, ruach, which is a Hebrew word for wind. And uh, it's a very important word for our Bible. By asking for this double portion, uh, he has asked for something worthy to be given to this prophet that is assuming the mantle of leadership from Elijah. Uh, he's uh, struck by uh, the fact that he would ask such a prudent thing uh, to continue the prophetic uh, ministry. Uh, this business about passing leadership along uh, offers us the opportunity to be patient people. We are not, by and large, patient people. Uh, we, we hardly see the wisdom of the way that older people have done things and the traditions that they have passed on to us. But uh, being in the church as long as I have, I'm, I'm maturing in the sense that I see that some of the many things that people have done for me uh, before I got there were prudent and good and right and were helpful to the people uh, of God. Generally speaking, we want the latest gadgets. We want the fastest computers. We, uh, we want uh, to do things in ways that other people don't do them. Uh, we want to watch things like the Super Bowl on the biggest screen TVs available. But the truth of the matter is that uh, we are who we are because we nurture and tweak the traditions that uh, people have given us. And uh, this is, I think, very important to us, this wisdom of listening to our ancestors about everything. As Christians, we gather that all things connect in Christ, as all things connect in our Christian traditions about Christ. Uh, Paul writes to the church in Corinth, for the love of Christ urges us on that Christ in Colossians uh, speaks about this idea of all things being connected in, in him. When I was a little kid growing up, I grew up in uh, Kansas City, uh, Missouri, actually Independence. And uh, not too far from my house was a big, major highway, and it was called U.S. Highway 40. It was the first highway built from coast to coast, and my father told me it was a very important highway, and it connected everything. Well, I don't think he really meant everything literally. He meant it connected New York and California, the states, and everything in between. It was important to me because Bev's root beer stand was on that highway, and that was a very important place for me to eat because I love chili cheese dogs. Uh, it was a place where the Blue Ridge Mall was, and later, as it turned out, they built the Kansas City Royals baseball stadium and the Kansas City Chiefs football stadium just about half a mile from this particular highway. U.S. Highway 40. Uh, one of the things that I did was I looked up one time what this highway connected. As my father said, it connected everything. And uh, I discovered that if you started at the beginning and drove to the end of it, you would see Cowboy, Cowtown, Rodeo, Newcastle, Maryland. You would see Fort Necessity, Uniontown, and Wheeling, West Virginia. You would see the National Road Museum in Columbus, Ohio. You would see Booneville, where Daniel Boone was named, uh, in Independence, Missouri. You would see Denver, Colorado. You would see Berthoud Pass and Steamboat Springs, Colorado. You would see Salt Lake City, Utah, and Winnemucca, Nevada. You would see Reno, and finally, you would arrive at San Francisco, California. This highway linked 
two oceans and 14 states. And I want to say that this highway is representative of Jesus because if you scratch the surface of any Christian or any Christian church, you will know that there is a Christ beneath it to be its foundation and that it will connect every single thing. And so as we prepare to transfer uh, leadership from one generation of another, let us remember that what links all Christians uh, around the world and through the centuries is Jesus Christ himself. And today we celebrate his transfiguration. Amen. Please stand with me as we recite our affirmation of faith this morning, number 885. We believe in God the Father, infinite in wisdom, power, and love, whose mercy is over all his works and whose will is ever directed to his children's good. We believe in Jesus Christ, Son of God and Son of Man, the gift of the Father's unfailing grace, the ground of our hope, and the promise of our deliverance from sin and death. We believe in the Holy Spirit as the divine presence in our lives, whereby we are kept in perpetual remembrance of the truth of Christ and find strength and help in time of need. We believe that this faith should manifest itself in the service of love, as set forth in the example of our blessed Lord, to the end that the kingdom of God may come upon the earth. Amen. I'd like to invite you, if you would, to uh, make your confession of the Christian faith, that you proclaim Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, not only of your own life, but of the whole world and beyond. And so if you can make that your prayer, I invite you to do so. Terry? Our praise song today is titled Worthy of Your Name, and it might be new to us, but it's a, a, an incredible song, and I hope that uh, you prayerfully sing uh, as we go along. Uh, let's sing this together. of the Son of Man, stories of a Savior, holiness with human hands, treasure for the traitor, no ear has heard, no eye has seen, image of the Father.
ransom, my Savior, my refuge, my hiding place. And you're my helper, my healer, my blessed redeemer, my answer, my saving grace. And you're my hope in the shadows, my strength in the battle, my anchor for all my days. And you stand by my side, you stood in my place, Jesus, no other name. invite you to receive the benediction from the Lord. May God's spirit of mercy, hope, and love live in your life today, tomorrow, and forever. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand as we send forth. Uh, we pray that you have a great week. And as we uh, start Lent together, um, let's sing this as we go out this week. You are worthy. You are worthy of your name. You are worthy. You are worthy of your name. You are Hello everyone and welcome to the children's sermon. Today is Valentine's Day, isn't it? Yay! Well, Valentine's Day is not in the Bible, but when we think of this day, we think about love. That's right. Today's scripture talks about a special kind of love. How many kinds of love are there? Or better yet, what is the kind of love that we should most set our hearts on? You know, the greatest commandment that God gave us was to love him with all of our hearts, all of our minds, all of our strength, all of our soul. And the second part of his commandment was to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So when we say, I love that cereal or I love that car. Oh, I love these flowers. Yeah. Those are just ways to express things we really like, right? We like them a lot. But let's think about what it takes to really love each other. Our neighbors, who are strangers, families, friends, and enemies. You know, people. Well, in the Bible, there's a guy named Elijah. He's a well-known prophet of Israel. And a man. he was a man who was godly. And carried out God's work through prayer and action. He did this for many years. And when, then as Elijah was getting up in age, God saw it fit to send Elijah a friend and someone who could follow in Elijah's footsteps. He sent him a friend, a younger man named Elisha. Those names are kind of similar, but Elisha was the younger friend. And Elisha 
quickly learn from Elijah and they became best of friends. Now, when you have a friendship with someone, it's a special kind of bond, a special love, right? Okay, their holy friendship shows just shows us just how wonderful it is to have the love for a friend and just how meaningful it is to receive that kind of love. It also shows us to select our closest friends wisely. In 2 Kings 2.2, 2, Elisha says, stays with Elijah, and he's begging his older friend not to leave him. When, when Elijah told Elisha that he would be leaving town and going to Bethel, well, Elisha did not want him to go alone. So he said, as the Lord lives and as you live yourself, I will not leave you. Elisha was devoted to his friend. And he knew his older friend would make an excellent guide. And, and Elisha stayed with Elijah. And he followed him. And, and he learned from him until Elijah finally died. It's important to choose friends who are wise and holy and passionate about what they do. After all, we tend to become at least something like our friends. And we hang around them a long, uh, long enough, right? And by being a good friend to Elijah... Elisha had found the mentor and friend who would help him become a worthy prophet and servant of God. You know, in the Bible, we are given the highest example of friendship. Not just a friendship, but a relationship. That relationship between man and Jesus Christ. Jesus, in John 15, 13, says, that greater love has no one than this, than he lay down his life for his friends. Jesus Christ is the pure, purest example of a friend that we can find in the Bible. Laying down his life, his extraordinary, valuable life for all of his friends, including you and me, whom he loves. Although he had the power to call those around him his servants, he calls us friends instead. I tell you what, let's say a prayer. Everybody bow, bow your heads. Father in heaven, we give you thanks for sending us friendship and love. And we ask you that we might remember Elijah and Elisha's friendship and that we might remember that Jesus Christ, your son, calls us friend. Thank you for the love, God. In Jesus we pray. Amen. All right, you guys, have a great week. Bye-bye. Hello, Slater Youth, Slater Youth families. Hope that you are doing well wherever you are and whenever you are watching this video. Grief is a weird thing. If you've ever experienced grief and loss, which most of us have, the feelings associated with it can be very strange. I recently lost an uncle who... I looked up to as a child, absolutely idolized this man. He was in the Air Force. He was a military policeman. He'd been all over the world, had all of these adventures. And I really looked up to him. And he passed away from a disease that we knew would take his life. We knew he would never recover. And so when he passed away, the shock wasn't exactly traumatic. But it was still difficult. But the worst part of it was... Being reminded of him at random times during the day, just sitting down to eat dinner and suddenly tearing up, remembering him and what he meant to me. And grief is like that. It can be strange to deal with and come up at weird times. And therefore, it's a struggle. In today's passage, we see Elisha, who has been mentored by Elijah, is dealing with grief. And I'm not going to read the entire story to you. It's kind of long. The story, I think, shows us several things about the process of grieving that I want us to talk about. And you may not find yourself in all of these situations, but I hope that they will mean something to you no matter which situation you're in. First off, Elisha sees Elijah being taken up into heaven. And Elijah had told him earlier in the story, if you see me when I'm taking from you, then you'll receive this spiritual gift that you've been asking for. Well, Elisha sees it, and his first response is not, yes, I've gotten this gift. His response is, I've lost my mentor. And the grief is overwhelming to him. And sometimes when we are grieving, we miss the gifts that God has given us. 
at the beginning. And this is not to minimize those feelings of grief. It's just to point out that sometimes that does happen. We've all been grieving what we've lost through this pandemic. And sometimes we forget to notice the good things that have happened because of it, the ways that we can reconnect to others in new and different ways that we may not have had before, like video sermons, something that I never thought I would be doing, but it gives you a way to listen to me in other venues than having to come to youth at your own time and your own leisure. And that's a good thing so that when you're ready, you can listen. The second thing I think this shows is that grief is not an easy path. In this story, Elisha has to leave the scene and cross the river and go back to his life. And it's this process in the story of going back to how normal really is. And we have to remember that there is no normal after you're grieving a loss. In this time of pandemic, we have to realize at some point normal is going to look very different and that there is no normal. It's just a new path that God has given us. So whether our grief is from the pandemic or the loss of someone close to us, to navigate that, understanding that sometimes it's just a new path that we're on can help us to do that. And finally, maybe we're not experiencing grief at all in our lives, but we know someone who is. And like Elisha walking with Elijah to his moment of departure, we can walk alongside those who are having transitions in their life, times where things are ending, times where their life is not going the way that they want it to, and things are winding down and they know it. And this isn't just about death, but it could be about a lot of things. Transitions happen in our lives, and we have to grieve the loss that we get through transition. Graduating can sometimes feel like a loss because we have to grieve the things that we're leaving behind. As much as we may be excited to go to college, we still have to deal with the loss of who we were and what we were doing, our sports, our friends, all of those things. And that's just one example of the transitions that we often go through, especially young people. There's transitions constantly. And you're always having to deal with that. So how can you be there for someone else to walk through that with them? So you see, the story has some multiple layers to it, different ways to see how we can deal with grief and loss. And I hope that some of this has been a blessing to you this morning. Thank you for listening, and we will see you soon.